In the previous video in the Jazz Tactics series, I showed you some clips of me in split screen. On one side, I was playing a transcription of Freddie Hubbard's solo on Birdlike. On the other, I was improvising my own solo, trying to stay within the style and spirit of Freddie. In the description for that video, I said this was like imagining myself trading choruses with Freddie Hubbard. Now I did acknowledge that in a true head-to-head -head comparison there would be no contest. Hearing me play Freddie Hubbard solo is not at all like hearing Freddie Hubbard, who was in almost anybody's estimation one of the greatest jazz trumpet players of all time. So to misquote my namesake Chevy Chase, he's Freddie Hubbard and I'm not. So the point is not to draw a comparison between Freddie Hubbard and me, thankfully but between me playing something that I transcribed and memorized versus something that I improvised. In the thumbnail, you see Clark Terry because he famously and concisely described the process of learning to improvise as imitate, assimilate, and then innovate. Now there's a lot of ways to be a musical innovator. Clark Terry didn't push the boundaries of the music like some musicians do. He stayed within a common harmonic framework, but within those boundaries he became one of the most instantly recognizable voices in jazz. Now there aren't really as many trumpet players who have followed closely in Clark Terry's footsteps as there are for Freddie Hubbard or Clifford Brown, for example. One reason for that is that Clark played the instrument differently than most people, but at a virtuosic level. He could play it upside down, he could hold one horn in each hand, he could circular breathe everything he played, and his doodle tongue articulation was unique. So here we have an original voice who acknowledged and embodied the idea that his innovations were rooted in imitation. Now this provides the rationale for transcription and belies the fear that imitating others may squelch your own voice. I talked about that in the video, but it's not really where I'm going here. I'm thinking about the difference between improvisation, where you don't know ahead of time what you're going to play next, and playing something that has been preconceived. If you're performing a composed piece of music, then the focus of the performer is not on what you're going to play, but on how you're going to play it. The artistry lies in the interpretation. Nobody objects if you play the notes that Mozart wrote, and to do otherwise when you're playing one of his compositions would be a bit of a faux pas, I think it's fair to say. An improvised solo is effectively a composition. Once it's transcribed, it can be replayed note for note. But when you recreate something that originated as spontaneous improvisation, the thought process, and therefore the end result, is different. Now I assume they utilize different areas of the brain. A jazz audience doesn't go to a concert expecting to hear solos that sound like they were preconceived. They go to witness not only the process of performance, but also the process of creation. When that process is absent, something vital is missing. In this video, I demonstrate and talked about the surprising difficulty of playing a transcription of one of my own solos along with the original recording. There are so many elements of time and tone and pitch that are infinitesimally precise that producing an exact copy is nearly impossible, even by the person who created the original. So this brings to mind the detailed recreation of Kind of Blue that was done by a band called Mostly Other People Do the Killing. The project, titled Blue, began as a thought experiment between university music students who were pursuing the question of what defines music as jazz. If you can recreate an improvised performance so accurately that it takes a fine ear to discern the difference, what is the difference? You could apply the question to visual art as well. If you can paint a copy of the Mona Lisa such that it takes an expert to spot the forgery, is that art? It's a high level of craftsmanship to be sure, but will someone looking at your painting feel the same way that they would looking at the original? Is it the responsibility of the artist to create something new? or is reinterpretation, even to the point of imitation, a valid form of art? These are some of the questions that the band sought to provoke, and they succeeded in that people had strong reactions, even to the point of anger. In an interview with Mappa Elliott, the bassist and band leader, he pointed out that no matter how closely one can imitate someone else, there will always be subtle little differences. Now that might be in the technical aspects of how he plays the bass compared to Paul Chambers, but he also acknowledges that the life experience that brought him to the place where he could imitate Paul Chambers is completely different than Paul Chambers' life experience. Now we can easily apply this to the example of Clark Terry. 
His ebullient personality was fully apparent in his trumpet playing and in his mumble style of singing, which reflected the same musical approach. He was joyous and generous, even in later life with health problems, on full display in the 2014 documentary Keep On Keepin' On, and if you haven't seen that, you need to. So this gets us to the idea that the thing that truly makes us unique as musicians is the fact that we are unique as human beings. It also goes to the fact that music, whether that's a Mozart composition or a Freddie Hubbard solo, is about much more than the notes. As Mappa Elliott put it, maybe the least interesting thing about the music is the notes. The most interesting things are all of those aspects of music that are non-notable. I've talked about this in other videos, that your ears can hear things that your eyes cannot see and therefore cannot be notated. When you transcribe a solo, all that oral information is going in, even while you're concentrating on the notes. When you play a transcription, the closer you can sound to the original, the more information you've absorbed. It's not about imitation, but immersion. So when I say that I'm trying to improvise in the style and spirit of Freddie Hubbard, I'm not trying to, nor am I able to, impersonate him, but to draw on the inspiration that I feel when I listen to him. That's true for Clark Terry and Clifford Brown and Louis Armstrong and Kenny Durham and Roy Eldridge and Miles Davis and Chet Baker and all the other trumpet players and non-trumpet players that I transcribed in my formative years. The sum total of who I am as a musician comes from everyone that I've listened to, but I've gotten the most from those I've transcribed because that's the deepest level of listening. There's more on this topic coming up in the Jazz Tactics series. <laughs>